like to start by introducing uh, the very esteemed panel that we have. Uh, the first is the Honourable Member of Parliament, uh, Deputy Minister for Tourism, uh, Dr. Ziblim Idi. Thanks for coming, sir. And then we have Professor Kweku Apiodu, who heads the delivery unit at the Vice President's office, at the office of the President. Right. And then we have Mr. Chinebua Fuku, who sits on the board of the Ghana Infrastructure Fund and is a banker as well. So, so on the panel, in essence, we have a technocrat, uh, a member of parliament, and a banker. Uh, so I hope we can do justice to the, to the theme of, uh, of the discussion. Honorable, can I start with Marine Drive? We watched the video. Uh, a lot has been said about it. Um, where is it at? When are you going to deliver Marine Drive? Thank you so much. Uh, I think yesterday the Vice President referenced the Marine Drive in his speech. And that, for me, demonstrates how important uh, the President and the government takes this project. Uh, coming into office last year, we realized that uh, tourism over the years has actually not been taken you know, seriously. And the President mainstreamed tourism into his economic agenda. Uh, and by that, he put tourism at the center of job creation and revenue generation. Uh, we describe tourism as a low-hanging fruit that you can use to create jobs. Uh, now, tourism is the fourth largest foreign exchange uh, earner for the country. Uh, the president has tasked us to actually move it further to maybe overcome oil and cocoa. Uh, now, with the marine drive projects, uh, we realized right away that the weakest link in the tourism sector was infrastructure. And the president came in and said, can we look at our coastline? Uh, Ghana, you know, it has often been said, Accra is the only city that develops with its back facing the sea, you know, instead of rather, you know, developing towards the sea. Uh, so the president said we should set into motion, you know, realizing the dreams of Nkrumah, you know, and that was trying to develop the sea coast to be a major, you know, uh, tourism for, for, for leisure, of course. Uh, so uh, we have an uncle developer. The project uh, was inherited in a way because the land was already acquired when we came into office. Uh, there is an EI, an executive instrument, that has actually uh, compulsorily acquired the land for government. So government has the land and we are leveraging that. Now the anchor developer, uh, as we speak, has gone almost 60% preparing the land for infrastructure. Uh, and we are pushing that by close of year, uh, we should be able to start real construction going on. Uh, we have engaged the anchor developer. He's working with the SIC financials. They have done the feasibility studies, uh, so they have all the figures worked out in terms of the viability of the project. Uh, what I see sitting at my desk is that it's a very viable project. Uh, I think if you look at the feasibility studies on the financials, uh, there's so much in terms of returns on investment, uh, and most of the projects will be paid off in a very you know, reasonable uh, time. Uh, so we are hoping that by close of year, uh, we should start construction. Uh, the whole project is divided into three components. Uh, we have a commercial district, a financial district, and then uh, a residential district. Uh, for the commercial district, you're going to have, you know, hospitalities. Uh, so we're looking at developing maybe one, no, two five-star hotels, two four-star hotels, and there'll be one, you know, service apartments. Uh, you will have you know, conferences for, for MICE, of course. Uh, and at the financial district, you know, we get some few financial institutes. The Bank of Ghana actually uh, may set up its headquarters in, in, in the enclave. Then the residential bit will give you about 350, you know, uh, apartments. Uh, and in between, you're going to have entertainment. So, you know, you're going to have you know, more. Uh, we actually are moving back the art center. So there will be an art center for art gallery uh, and, and all of that. So this is a huge project. I think it's one of the biggest infrastructure projects for the government. The president has taken personal interest. He actually commissioned Sir David Ajay to come up with a design. Uh, and he's the, Sir, David, Sir David is our consultant. So we are working with him almost every day as we engage potential investors. Uh, the Anchor developer has the feasibility work out, and any potential investor 
uh, we you know will link you up with, with the Alco developer. Uh, I think we have the figures uh, and I have looked at them and they are looking very good. Uh, beyond the Marindra, because it's not just one project, we have other bankable projects. Uh, I think we have the Aquaba Hotels project that is coming up. Uh, it is something that we thought uh, we can use to fill the gap. Uh, if you travel across Ghana, we have just a little over 2,700, you know, accommodation, you know, for tourists. And this is not enough. So we came out with the Aquaba Hotels, you know, sort of like a budget hotels, you know, closer to tourist sites. Uh, there is one that we want to start with at Ebre. Uh, we've done the feasibilities on it. Uh, the, 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 the figures are looking good. Uh, so potential investors who wants to come in, uh, we can use that as a prototype. Uh, What's the model? It's, it's, is it a PPP or...? Yes. So it's a PPP. So government is actually you know, acquiring land, using that as equity, uh, and then we engage with the private sector. So uh, we don't want, as a minister and for the government, to be the one running hotels. We are, that's not our business. Uh, but we are very much interested in supporting private sector that want to get into hospitality. And so uh, we've acquired the land in Ebru. We are looking at what the, the idea is to get this Aquaba hotels closer to tourist sites closer to tourist attractions. And we all know every, you know, in that enclave uh, is, is very close. And of course, very close to our craft for conferencing. Uh, so uh, yes, government is taking equity interest by providing land. Uh, I think the figures I was looking at for that project in Ebru, you're looking at 3.5 million. Uh, I think 5 million will come in the form of the land and other things. And then you get 3 million. Uh, starting with 25 rooms for just, you know, your everyday, you know, and then 75 rooms, so 100 room, you know, uh, uh, hotel, yes. Uh, but we want to replicate that, you know, all across the country. We have identified about 10 tourist sites that we want to do this, uh, but we are starting with Ebre. Uh, there's a third one, uh, Baobab River Lodge, and, and this is uh, in, in Akosombo, actually, uh, along the Volta River. Uh, and that is also a hotel project. Uh, the, 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 we have done some work on it. Uh, it's actually a private initiative, but the ministry, you know, we understand that uh, the private sector needs to be supported, and for us to, you know, uh, encourage investors to come, and we have to have equity, you know, that will give a sort of guarantee to investors. So uh, we've looked at Baobab. They have done the feasibilities. Uh, they have sat with the ministry, and uh, we are convinced that it's a very viable project. You know, you're looking at rate of returns at, you know, 12 percent, you know, 20 percent annual. You know, returns and uh, sort of being able to pay off in 60 months, you know, uh, and, and, and it's looking good. Uh, let me just give up for the Aquaba hotels, we want them to be budget hotels. So we're looking at like $80 average for a room, uh, and, and if you do the math, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's good. Uh, it can compete in, with any hotels, and, and we are making them so livable uh, for, for tourists. Uh, just like what you see in, in the West, you know, driving on any highway, budget hotels. Uh, the Aquaba hotels would be in that form. Uh, we have the center of the world project. Uh, yesterday it was referenced that Ghana is actually on the meridian. Uh, we are trying to develop a project in Tema, just around the harbor. So that uh, here in London, where you mention Big Ben, everybody knows London. When you mention the Statue of Liberty, everybody thinks New York. We want to have a, a, a project in Ghana, so that when you say center of the world tower, so to speak, everybody knows, okay, that's Accra, that's Ghana, that's Tema. Uh, and, and we are working on the feasibilities on that. Uh, of course, uh, once that is done, we'll go out looking for investors. Uh, that one, also, government will have equity. Uh, the harbor has been generous to give us land. Uh, uh, and we are using that as equity uh, to do the tourism, you know, development. I will do a golf course. Uh, we'll do a tower. Uh, we'll do, uh, you know, we're going to develop a church sort of so that people can come to the center of the world to get married. Okay. Uh, the golf course will promote, you know, golf tournament at the center of the world, you know, so that we can get all the best stars to come. And so, so these are some of the projects that that, that we're looking Thank at, you. and I'll be more than happy to discuss further. Thank you. I'm slightly worried that there seems to be a lot of government involvement in the, the different projects, but we'll come back to that later. Mr. Chinubo, Ghana Infrastructure Fund, are you going to invest in Marine Drive? Are you going to invest in Aquaba Hotels? If not, why? I think these projects that uh, Honorable has talked about, uh, they are all economically viable. Uh, they make economic sense. Uh, 
coming from my banking uh, sector, uh, banking background, uh, and being on the infrastructure board, uh, we look at projects that have got prospects that, are, that make economic sense, uh, projects that generate uh, enough uh, cash flow to service uh, debt, if debt was what was used to finance the project, uh, to pay dividend if it was uh, financed through equity, or uh, whichever way that the project was financed uh, through. So, uh, Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, we partner with a number of uh, agencies, being the government or private uh, sector uh, developers, to do a number of uh, uh, projects to develop the country. Uh, that is uh, our key mandate as a, as a government fund. So the projects that the, uh, the Honourable has talked about, yes, we're happy to come on board to create the enabling environment to give the comfort to uh, private people that will come on board. Uh, we will normally come in to put in the seed capital in the form of, let's say, equity to help uh, acquire the land uh, in this case and help organize uh, the platform for private uh, people to come on board. So uh, these projects that he's, he's talked about, if you look at, let's say, the Marine Drive, uh, if you've been to Accra before, uh, or if you've not been there, you can still uh, even use the internet to check. You realize we've got a long uh, coastline, uh, beautiful, but then the city is developing in the other way, uh, rather than developing towards uh, the coastline, which is very beautiful. So uh, the demand is there. Uh, the few big hotels that are closer to the coastline, uh, the demand is so high. And the surveys have been done that uh, if hotels were built quite closer to the coastline, uh, the demand is there. So once you have got that demand, that is a first tick to know that a project will be, will be viable. Uh, so. It is good to have uh, these projects that make economic sense. Uh, Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund is ready to come on board, like I said, to uh, make it easy for private people to come on board. So we are all ready uh, to support these projects uh, which make uh, economic sense. Yeah. I, I don't want the discussion to be solely on infrastructure, but it's, it's a big part of what is happening. Um, can you tell us from the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. And for those that don't know about the fund, it's a government owned or it's a government fund uh, of $250 million, uh, which is meant to go into infrastructure across the different sectors in Ghana. Can you tell us some of the projects you have invested in over the last year and what are some of the projects you're looking at? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, uh, we are there to mobilize funds and invest in uh, in a variety of infrastructure projects to support uh, the country's development. Uh, so far, we've gone into different sectors. Uh, we've invested in the port projects. Uh, if you remember yesterday when the Vice President delivered his speech, he said that the economic growth of the country has been phenomenal. Last year, we grew above 8%. And uh, if we know uh, there's a direct correlation between uh, economic growth and the port activities. So your economy is growing, your port is also getting busy. Okay? And you need to expand your facilities. So we've invested uh, quite a lot in the port uh, facilities expansion. Uh, more ships are coming to birth, bigger ones. We need to dredge more, give them capacity, uh, space to come and land. We need uh, multi-purpose facilities in terms of uh, storage. Uh, for containers, for a lot of facilities uh, that go with the group. So we've invested a lot. The visa projects that make a lot of economic sense. Uh, we've got shippers that will sign contracts with you. You've been well ahead before you start the project. Once they know you are serious, you're going to get these projects done. So contracts sign ahead, which guarantees you the income. Once your income is guaranteed, it's a big tick for you. Okay. Uh, you are an investor and you want to invest in the port, uh, and if currency uh, depreciation is your issue, these shippers will pay you in USD. You can even, if you borrowed from your country here, you could have an escrow account here uh, where funds will be paid into directly to service uh, the bankers that uh, fund you. So uh, these are projects that, uh, this is a project that make a lot of economic sense. Uh, aside that, uh, we've invested in uh, 
in the in the road uh, or transportation sector uh, general uh, one of the key projects that we're looking at was also played here which is the railway sector uh, as cities build up there's like uh, we have in London as well uh, Accra is building up it's growing now the need for efficient transportation uh, is, is staring at our face uh, we've done the surveys and it makes a lot of sense to have uh, railway system in the cities and also in between uh, the, the cities. Uh, so Accra, as I speak with you, there's a push to have what we call Sky uh, Rail in Accra, which uh, my board is pushing uh, to get it done. So we're it's going, like a light rail. Like light line. rail, yeah. yeah. So we call it Sky Rail. So we're ready to put in uh, a lot of equity to create the platform for private people to come on board. This is a project that is uh, ongoing. It makes a lot of uh, economic sense. We are into uh, the ICT as well. Uh, ICT, uh, we're trying to get fiber optic across uh, the western corridor of the country uh, to link cities along uh, the western corridor to ICT uh, to be able to transfer data easily. We've done the studies. This makes a lot of economic sense. If you're putting it uh, debt as your investment or equity, we've done the studies. Uh, the, the information is there if you want to have access to. Uh, we've already put in a lot of equity as well to create in the enabling uh, uh, platform for private sector to come. So there's a lot. Uh, later on, I'll talk about the, uh, why I think uh, the, the, the president's uh, key uh, flagship project, the 1D1F, are also uh, bankable. Uh, I've got a lot to talk about that, okay. but I'll give her this chance to talk Excellent. and then we'll pick that one up. Prof. Oxide. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> well, in the 1960s, as we know, a company called Varco was set up, and it's the main smelter that you have in the whole of the West African region. It consumes a lot of energy. And so a dam called the Akosombo Dam was put up to provide lots of the power requirements for this company to function. The company has had its ups and downs, but it remains the anchor establishment or industry of the whole integrated aluminium sector. We also have mines. We have maybe the fourth largest deposits of mines and there's a lot of work that is going on at the moment to determine the proven reserves of bauxite which we have in Ghana. Having said that, since 1920, Loads of studies have been undertaken. And really, if you put together the secondary data that we have collected so far over the years, from Kaiser, through Alutev, through Exton, Cubic, through Alcan and Alcoa, and other companies, world-renowned companies that have actually come into Ghana to undertake studies, we believe that conservatively we have over 900 million metric tons of bauxite in Ghana. What is missing in this link, if you take the first three phases of the integrated aluminium industry as a refinery? So let me add the fourth piece and say that there's also the downstream aspect of the industry. So we have our own locals like Tropical, Cable Conductor Limited, Domot, Aluex, and so on and so forth that are involved in the production of roofing sheets, cables and metals, and all that which we can consider to be downstream. So really, what we are missing is the refinery, or a refinery. Now, Kwame Nkrumah's dream was for us to build a refinery. But the geopolitics of the world and of the industry and the cartel in which we find ourselves, especially in the industry, 
did not make that possible. President Kufo made a great attempt to get this integrated aluminum dream realized, but he ran out of time. So we can put it that way, okay? Because he had only eight years to do it and he started in a second term vigorously. This government, led by Nana Adedankwa Ekufuado, believes that we really have to get this integrated aluminium industry project or dream realized. Mm -hmm. So we have gone into great efforts to get partners to come in and work with us. Now, Varco was built in the 60s. Time has moved on. The equipment that we have at Varco, yes, is able to do a good job today, but to make it more efficient and effective, we need to do retrofitting. So, talking about investment opportunities, we would need partners to come along with us to retrofit Varco, to make it more modern, more efficient, more effective, more productive. And the good news about VACO today, as we speak, is that a couple of years ago, VACO was being given power or electricity at about seven cents per kilowatt hour. Today, because government is really committed to the integrated aluminium industry project, a policy has been made to give VACO power at 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Which is very competitive. That makes VACO competitive right from day one when you compare to similar smelters in China, Australia, the US, and so on and so forth. So VACO is now at least competitive in terms of power or consumption of electricity. So that's one aspect of the dream that we are moving forward. Based on the reserves that we have, and we are working very hard, in fact, there is a company that has undertaken its own study on one of the sites to come up with something which is close to about 80% confidence level that what we have at Chebi, for example, is quite close to the estimates that we've been discussing or talking about over the past few years. And there is a, a study that is ongoing to establish the bauxite resource assessment that we have as a country. But what we are saying is that conservatively with our 900 million metric tons, we have every reason to put up a refinery. A two million metric ton refinery has been found to be about the optimum that you could get in terms of efficiencies and all that. So you could even have two million metric ton bauxite refineries in modules on the same site. And so we are looking at having a refinery and what we're saying is that it's possible to have more than one refinery. The bauxite grades that we have at Chebi, Yenahin, and Yenahin has about 750 million metric tons of bauxite probable reserves. Chebi has about 180 to 200 million metric tons of bauxite. Awaso has been mined since 1940, but Awaso still has at least 20 million metric tons of bauxite to go. There are five hills at Awaso. Only two have been licensed by way of concession. The other three hills remain virgin. So we can give out that, for example, to somebody who comes in and says, I want to do bauxite mining. So, in short, there is a potential for companies to come in and work with us at Nyerehin, at Chebi, and also at Awasu. At the moment, bauxite is still being mined in Ghana, but it's not refined. It's exported in its raw state. And yesterday, you might have heard of some figures. Bauxite in its raw state hovers between $30 and $60 per metric ton, depending on market conditions, the de demand in China, which is the largest market at the moment, the grade of bauxite and all that. Refined bauxite, which is alumina, will fetch you anything between $400 and $700 per metric ton. Indeed, 
There was a problem with a company in Brazil, which was one of the leading producers of alumina. Now, that caused the shortage in the world in alumina. And Vaco was buying it at about $700 per metric ton. So look at the value addition from 30 to 60 to 400 to 700. And then when you go aluminum, which is what Vaco produces, you're looking at about $2,000 dollars per metric ton. It can go up to 2,500. Again, prices change every day, as we know. It's a commodity. Go downstream, and you could have your alloys and, and all that being sold at about $6,000 per metric ton. So the value addition is a no-brainer, and that is where we are heading towards. Somebody may ask, how do I participate in these sectors? So if you want me to go on and yeah. talk a bit about that, mining of bauxite, and, and that, for example, if Ghana wants to mine, let's say, 8 million metric tons per annum of bauxite, which is possible, we would need about $500 million as capital to, to start up and set up your equipment and all that. So. That is the amount that we are looking at. It may seem a bit high. Um, you go to alumina, a refinery, 2 million metric tons refinery. You're looking at about $2 billion to build a 2 million. I mean, it could go up to 2.6, but let's just make it 2 billion US dollars. VACO, retrofitting of VACO will cost you about 550 million US dollars. So between 500 and 600 million US dollars to bring Barco to the point where it can function at the maximum capacity, which is 200,000 metric tons at the moment per annum, but it can go up to 2,000 or 290,000 metric tons per annum, depending on, you know, how much the appetite of an investor is. So there are, there are all these opportunities. But if these figures appear to be huge for the ordinary man, what we can say is that downstream, there are many more opportunities that are available. Now, aluminum, well, now let's start with bauxite. Bauxite, the washed bauxite itself. From that, you can obtain alum. Alum can be used to treat water. So even basic, you can get something to do with a washed bauxite. You can also have waste from the bauxite, which can be used to set up concrete tiles, brick tiles, pavement tiles. So again, there, precast. That is something that is possible at the bauxite level. And then when you go downstream, that's where you have all the other, your chips, your car parts, your alloy wheels, your utensils, aircraft parts, and so on and so forth. So it's a vast industry. Vaco conducted a study because it had to make a point to government that we need power at a certain rate. You also need to sustain this dream because if Vaco dies, the whole integrated aluminum industry dream is dead. Let's remember that Vaco is the only smelter that we have in the whole of West Africa. And indeed, in Africa, probably there are just about two or three smelters. So the dream is to get all these components of the industry running. But in addition to that, for your alumina refinery, there are certain inputs. Caustic soda will be used, chlorine will be used, salt will be used. So all these are possible industries that potential investors could think about. And then when you get downstream, what you have to remember is that as, as you move from the bauxite through to the downstream industry, there are also the support industries. So your rail, at the moment we cut bauxite by road, and it's damaged all our roads from Awaso to Tabrade or to our ports. So you have your rail. Energy provision is also very important. So power plants and all that can be set up on the sides to do that. 
your ports, expansion of your ports and so on and so forth, technology transfer and, and skills transfer. So you have a huge industry, and I was talking about research which was conducted by Valve, who would end by saying, looking at value addition across the various sectors of your integrated aluminium industry, over two million jobs. And let's remember, we always talk about income or revenue, but we also talk about profits and job creation, which is very important in a country such as ours and throughout the world. So over two million jobs over a 10-year period, ten period could be created if we get this whole equation right. And I believe that if we take our time, talking to the right partners, what I'd like to finally add, add before I pause is that Ghana government will be looking for joint venture partners, but we are also interested in Ghanaian or private sector participation. So government will have a stake. There's a, there's a company that has been set up recently by the, an act of parliament called the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation, which is going to function more like a private sector business-like body. And this company will hold shares on behalf of Ghana government. So all of us who are Ghanaians, part of Ghana government, this company will hold shares on our behalf in any joint venture that we enter into in the industry. Then there will be government's own shares, right? So there will be government's own shares. And then, in addition to that, there will be the private sector shares. So you, Tony, if you have money, you are welcome to invest. And all of us here, if we have money, we are welcome to invest. So it's called the Ghanaian participation. So all that will be important. The private entity coming in, from abroad, the Ghanaian private sector person, man or woman, and Ghana government will have shares in every joint venture that we enter into. Excellent. I wouldn't add much to what uh, the vice president delivered uh, yesterday, where he talked about the, uh, the economic uh, position of the country. Uh, as we know, uh, SMP has uh, recently uh, upgraded the country's rating. Uh, from B minus to B uh, with a stable outlook, which is really positive and tells us that uh, the economy is on a good uh, pedestal to move on. And uh, when you have an economy that is on a good pedestal that has been uh, rated uh, better by an independent uh, rating agency, then it gives you the comfort and the confidence that the future is, uh, is bright. And uh, it links directly to uh, the topic for uh, this period, uh, which is bankable uh, projects. Uh, if you have an economy that is doing well, then it creates the avenues for uh, businesses to do well and to bring businesses that make uh, uh, economic sense. Okay. You know, so I think we have uh, the platform to move on as a country uh, to develop all sectors. And uh, like I initially uh, said, all the sectors we've got bankable projects because the economy is doing well from all sectors. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can talk about uh, the, the president's uh, flagship project, yes. why I think uh, uh, it's, it's bankable. So uh, we've been talking about 1D1F, which is key to uh, this government, the, gov uh, the president has been driving it. And Sorry. in, in the... Can you explain 1D1F? Okay, so the one, it's called the One District, One Factory uh, Project, which is uh, being driven by uh, the president himself. Okay, so uh, the president is saying, we have got pockets in the country, the districts, that are good at producing uh, certain produce, that have got certain minerals that have to be uh, harnessed, and so on and so forth. Uh, as we have it now, you could have produce from different districts far away from the capital, far away from the post, that have to be harvested, transported all the way to, let's say, the port to be shipped in raw form. We've got uh, minerals that have to be extracted in its raw form, transported all the way, let's say, to the port to be shipped away. He's saying now we have to send processing centers to the hubs of these uh, produce 
the hubs of these uh, mineral extraction centers. We need to process these right on site. What this gives you, and that this is what makes it bankable, okay? Uh, firstly, you are producing these on site. You're not transporting all the raw materials, all the raw produce uh, far away to, to process. You're going to process it right on spot. So you're saving costs. And saving costs makes projects bankable. Okay, at the end of the day, it's your revenue cost, your profits, and you're getting the good cash flows to service your debt or pay equity or whatever you want to do with your free cash flow. So we send them processing centers to the hubs of these uh, produce and extraction uh, centers. So it makes a lot of economic sense to get involved. If you want to get involved in this one district, one factory, what we call 1D1F, uh, we've got a centers. If you contact us, we'll give you uh, the details. A lot of work has been done uh, around it, uh, which uh, makes it easy for any uh, prospective investor to get the right information uh, to come on board. Okay, so you're reducing costs. You are not transporting raw materials far away. You're doing it right there. You've got the labor, labor that is cheaper because you are going to the hinterlands, you are going to the districts. Labor is cheaper there compared to, let's say, the cities, Accra and so on. So labor is cheaper. You are not transporting raw materials far away. You are producing it there and then. Uh, the government is also giving you incentives. It's sending electricity to the hinterlands. Already Ghana is, I mean, well uh, uh, connected to the electricity when you go to the rural areas. It's connecting roads to these centers. So it's giving you all the enablement to produce there and then. So these are projects that are economically viable. And, sorry, you work for a bank, right? Are you guys yeah. lending to companies in this uh, 1D1F? Uh, yes, a, a lot of them are coming around and it makes sense to do business with them. Okay, uh, as, as a banker, I mean, uh, everything might make economic sense. Uh, if, if you come in to me, I'm looking at what you're generating. Is it sustainable? What you're spending, is it sustainable? At the end of the day, what is left for us to look at? It's not a social uh, avenue, it's economic uh, stuff. So uh, if, you, if it's making sense economically, then I'm ready to come on board to risk uh, something. And that is what I'm, I'm selling to investors, that a lot of these projects make economic sense. Like I said, you're saving cost. Uh, government is creating the, the enablement. The roads are being created. Some are there already. Electricity being sent to the centers. Uh, labor cost is cheap in those places. And the drive is there. This is a flagship project for the government, and it's ready to support you. So it's really bankable, a number of them in all sectors. And we can go into the details. Before we go to the audience, you were telling me about a friend who's come from the U.S. and is taking advantage of this 1D1F. Can you briefly tell us what the factory is, what they're doing? Yes. So, ju just to say that um, I wasn't aware that I was coming over this morning. I was just informed yesterday. And my friend is in Ghana. This friend I have been liaising with just to try and find out how he's getting on. He is an MIT graduate, but that is neither here nor there. He worked with Johnson & Johnson and then Pfizer and decided one day enough was enough in the United States and he decided to relocate to Ghana. So he's been in Ghana for the past 10 years and this is a testimony just to encourage those of us who may not have millions to maybe pack and return home or come home and try and get a business going. He came to Ghana with virtually nothing, right? So let's say some, something less than 100,000 US dollars. He's been in fish farming for the past 10 years, cultivating tilapia, growing tea, growing vegetables, and today, I'm pleased to see Mr. Ansom Reisua here. GCB is supporting him to the tune of 7.5 million Ghana CDs. Converted to dollars, 1.5. If it's 1 to 5, 1 1.5 million US dollars to manufacture 
and market what he calls fish feed, floating fish feed. It went through the 1D1F process. All the boxes were ticked. It went through the credit committee of GCB and also the project committee of the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the 1D1F Secretariat of the Ministry passed all the tests and next week he is just moving in to collect his money and move further. And then he ended, he sent me a text with all these details. So I, I tried to memorize, you know, the details he sent to me this morning. And he said to me, I want to create an industry that the West will be proud of. So this is one testimony. And then another testimony. No, no, I think, I think we that is enough. I, I, wanted, I wanted to make, make my friend happy. Um, okay. Exit, but, okay, but, okay. but two it's seconds, okay. Two so seconds. two seconds. Two seconds. So that has to do with another friend who worked in the financial services sector, relocated to Ghana 10 years ago, has been in vegetable farming and, and rice farming. And today, he has over 5,000 acres of land which he's cultivating and is in the process of accessing 13 million US dollars, also working with Brazilians and all that to produce perfumed rice. So, so yeah. come small yeah. and develop. So it works, it works. Yes, so it's, 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 okay, good. I think we'll, 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 open, we'll open it to, to questions. Uh, the, I'm, the, I'm the chairman of Nigeria Investment Gateway Limited, based here in the UK. Um, thank you very much for what you guys are doing. I'm really impressed with Ghana. I was in Ghana the other time, and I was blown away by what you're doing. When it comes to investors, um, you talked about the $500 million for mining uh, bauxite and uh, $2.6 billion. What kind of guarantee is the government going to give to investors? For example, SBLC, BGs, what kind of guarantee is the government going to give? So that's one question. And the other question is, do you have a list of these bankable projects that you can actually access without um, going through, you mentioned four different sector, um, secretariats. Could you have a one-stop shop where one person can come in and get all these information? I think I have a few more questions, but I'll keep it at that. We'll, we'll take, Thank you, Pierre. You spoke eloquently about the bauxite investments. I mean, recently we are told that there's been some butter agreement between Ghana and China to the tune of about $2 billion for infrastructure in exchange for our bauxite. How does that play into uh, your, your, I mean, suggestion that we should come and invest in, in bauxite industry in Ghana? I just have a simple question to ask. We've got a 30-year company in Karachi for infrastructure. We've been into construction, we've been into building roads and uh, all kind of infrastructure. We're interested in setting up an uh, uh, industrial park at the moment in Nigeria. So, you know, I'm just thinking that uh, we'll be able to do that also in, in Ghana. But my question is that we've got two things. One is we've got an infrastructure company, and the secondly, we want to come and set up an industrial park. So I wanted to ask uh, that as far as the investment wise is concerned, would they be able to invest with us because we'll be investing in an infrastructure on our own because we want to bring in some companies from Pakistan for manufacturing automobile components and textile city. Yes, indeed, true. It's a barter arrangement that we have. It is not a loan. Uh, it's, it's a barter arrangement. What that means is that in estimating the quantity of bauxite or refined bauxite, and the agreement really says refined bauxite. So we're not going to pay with bauxite, because if we say we're paying with bauxite, it's going to take forever to pay. And we'll have to, uh, if, if you like, extract so much of the bauxite every year. So we have a three-year moratorium. So during the first three years, we're not making any payments. The plan is that by the end of the three-year period, tight as it may seem, government should be in a position to put up a refinery so that we start paying the loan when 
repayments kick in with refined bauxite. I'll give you the figures. So if you take alumina, for example, and it's selling at an average, let's say 500 US dollars, it is better than paying with bauxite, which may sell at $50. So with that, we have already a model. And anyone who is an investor would come, and we can sit down, and we can look at the model. You can satisfy yourself and say, it works for me, it doesn't work for me. But we know it works. So just to let you know that there is nothing to fear as such. The books will be open, we'll sit down, we talk, and the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation is going to function as a, a, a true corporate body with corporate and business principles. And that is the way we want it to be, so that all our arrangements would be above board, business-like, and we wouldn't have potential invest investors being apprehensive of coming into Ghana to invest. Got it. The Honorable, I want you to take his question. So Ghana uh, GIPC has a list of all the bankable projects in Ghana. Uh, Yofi Grant is the CEO. You should catch him before you go. But Honorable, he asked a very interesting question. Is the government going to provide, not just for Marine Drive, but for the other infrastructure projects, are there government guarantees available at the moment? So, so there are <coughs> different investment models that are out there. Uh, in terms of sovereign guarantee, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, since last year, uh, has been looking at the budget and, and seeing where, you know, if there is any room for government to commit to, to sovereign guarantee. Uh, but in lieu of sovereign guarantee, uh, government is always ready uh, to come in with equity. Uh, and in most cases, in the case of the marine drive, uh, we're leveraging the land, uh, and I think the Aquaba hotels, we are leveraging the land. Uh, we have existing, you know, businesses that are under these models, and they are doing very well. Uh, for the hospitality industry, for those of you who know Ghana, uh, Kempiski, uh, Moving Pick, and I think City Hotel. Uh, these are three big hospitality you know, facilities that came through a special purpose vehicle created by government, and government leveraged land in some cases, uh, and in other cases, government have shares, you know, and, and they are doing very well. Uh, so I think it's for the finance minister to assess the situation and see what the government can do outright sovereign guarantee, but I'm saying in lieu of that, you know, where the finances of our state will not permit or allow us to commit to sovereign guarantee. Uh, government will always find ways of providing equity. And I think this, this question should be put in perspective. Uh, this government uh, comes from a tradition that believes in the new liberal economic you know, values. So we are not about to uh, get involved in state-run you know, enterprises. Uh, so we recognize and appreciate the role the private sector plays. Uh, and if government can do anything. So we are moving away from the rhetoric of creating an enabling environment to actually, you know, practically, you know, providing, you know, that environment for businesses to come in. Uh, so, so if you are not getting sovereign guarantee, it doesn't mean that government will not have interest uh, in terms of equity. Uh, and there are special purpose vehicles that we can create uh, to, to, for government to do that. Thank you, Honourable. I mean, to add, look, I work for the British Ghana Chamber of Commerce. I can tell you that it's very unlikely that the government of Ghana is going to be issuing sovereign guarantees to infrastructure projects. That's my personal view. So if, if your project requires a government guarantee and you can't find another way to structure that investment, I suspect that you struggle. The last word to you, Mr. Chinobua, he asked about partnering the, with GIF to invest in industrial parks. Is that something GIF would look at? or? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that, but just a quick one on the question on guarantee, just I want to clarify. Uh, and Prof, you could uh, clarify as well. I, I think we're calling on investors to come in and invest their funds, and we're saying government will uh, create the enabling environment. So the guarantee that he's talking about, um, I'm trying to understand, uh, because uh, you're not lending to the government, for the government to provide you with a sovereign guarantee. You know, you're coming in as a private investor to put in your, your money. The government has created the investment. So probably you're talking about maybe uh, uh, transfer and comfortability 
rates, whether the government will hold you from repatriating your funds when you've made profit and giving your capital or converting your funds to uh, hard currency and sending it back home. Probably that is what you're talking about, but I don't think uh, you're asking for uh, private people to lend to the government. That is where you provide sovereign uh, guarantees, or maybe just the clarity. I hope that is clear. But on the, on the industrial park, uh, yeah, like I said initially, uh, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund is a body corporate. Okay, uh, so we work like a corporate body uh, that invests in businesses that make economic sense, like I said. So, uh, industrial park, currently, if I cast my mind around, there's not much uh, around uh, in Ghana. People travel outside Ghana to uh, assess these kind of facilities. So, definitely, the demand for it is there. And once the demand is there, uh, it takes a big box, okay, it takes a big box. So if the demand is there, sustained demand is there, uh, then uh, we could have a conversation, okay, we have a conversation, look at the cost that has to go into it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the revenue that we'll get over a specified period of time. So uh, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund uh, is business-minded, even though we are pro-government because we are entirely owned by the government. Uh, we have an economic sense. Uh, we will think alongside uh, with you. We are ready to be a little softer in terms of putting our funds in first to create uh, the grounds for you to come in. So uh, it's a discussion, conversation that we could, we could have uh, and, uh, you know, take it further. But we're ready to partner with uh, uh, businesses that are ready to come in to do such uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can add that there is, I think there are about five industrial parks in Ghana at the moment, and they're all privately owned uh, without any government investment whatsoever. Uh, the trade ministry is helping companies out to set up industrial parks, but that's around the logistics, that's around the um, legal and regulatory frameworks, but there's not government investment per se into industrial parks. Prof, I'll give you the last word, one minute. Bankable projects in Ghana. Oh, bankable projects... Railways, for example, I'll, I'll take that as an example. If you look at the, the concept, it's not only about the trucks and the fact that they can be very expensive and you may not have all the money in the world to develop the trucks. From city to city, there are usually stations which would be developed, commercial centers that would be developed along the line for investors to come in and invest maybe a couple of thousands of US dollars to be able to participate in the real sector. So in there as well, there are opportunities. But what one would like to say is that Shama, the greater Kumasi industrial city, these are very, very dear to the heart of the government. And for those of us who are looking for light-scale industries to be involved in, these are definitely areas that you could be looking at. They come with incentives. Yesterday, the Free Zones CEO had the opportunity to tell us about incentives that would accrue to companies that would come in and satisfy the conditions that are required by the Free Zones board. So I would say there's the large-scale investment, there's the mid-scale investment, as the small scale investment. And I believe that there is an opportunity for any entrepreneur who wants to come into Ghana. The basic thing is that the proper enabling environment has been created for all types of businesses to accept. I said I'll give you the last word, but I remember we have a senior here. So, all right, please, the last word to you. Yeah. I think uh, I would just like to say that uh, Ghana has comparative advantage and you know, so many aspects of tourism, heritage tourism, cultural tourism, ecotourism. 
and the president has appreciated this much. And so we are looking forward for investors. Uh, as I indicated, the infrastructure, the tourism infrastructure has been allowed to degenerate and we are trying to develop that to close the gap so that we're able to overcome. Unfortunately, Ghana is not doing well in terms of the rankings. I think we are 17th in Africa and about 120 in the world. Uh, and looking at the advantages that we have, especially festivals, cultures, we have the highest per capita, you know, forts and castles in, in Africa, actually. Uh, and, and so uh, we are starting from next year trying to draw in more people and we need to build the infrastructure. So we say come in. Uh, the president is very, you know, taking very personal interest in getting tourism to take the center stage in our economic agenda, development agenda. Uh, so we are encouraged to come in. Uh, finally, let me just say that this, this president and this government as the vice president, you know, represented yesterday. I uh, mean business. We are in a hurry. We expect people to come. We want to partner with the world and we want to develop uh, a country that can stand out, you know, as one of the tigers of Africa. Uh, we had the Asian tigers. We are trying to build the African tigers. And Ghana is taking the lead. And you are all invited to come and join the boat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.